Sleep. It seems like our modern society, we can never get enough sleep, right? And we know it's good for our health. However, most people tend to prioritize things like exercise instead of sleep. But is it possible that exercise can also help you sleep better? In this episode, we're going to talk all about can exercise be used to improve your sleep? Let's get started. So thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Jordan Renicki. This is the Building Lifelong Athlete Podcast. And I thank you so much for stopping by. Our goal here is to help keep you active and healthy for life through actionable evidence-informed education. I really appreciate you stopping by. And today we're talking all about sleep. So first and first, I always talk about the importance. I like talking about the importance of why I may even bring this up. You know, I don't want to waste your time. I don't waste my time learning things. Uh, I just want to know what's so important about this topic. And it's important because sleep is critical, right? It plays so many roles in our health function, meaning things like cardiovascular disease, cancer, depression, all those things can be linked to issues with sleep. So we care deeply about it, right? So there's lots of stuff going on. So we want to sleep as well as possible so it can help us be more healthy. It's one of the big pillars I talk about in our you know, necessary nine. Sleep is like one of the big ones. Like if I had to say the big three ones, you know, your nutrition, exercise, sleep, sleep is up there. So sleep is super important. And then we also want to talk about this because it's actually really prevalent. Insomnia affects anywhere from what 10 to 50% of people. I know it's a huge, really wide range. Unfortunately, that's how data works. But 10 to 50% of people, that's crazy. Meaning like more than half, almost half people have some issue with sleep. So it's very common when I talk about it. So it's much more prevalent than I ever thought it was. You know, I see people all the time as a physician who have sleep issues, but I didn't think it would be this extreme. And so that's, that's something that I think we need to consider. And I think it's really worth talking about today. And I want to talk about here is how does exercise actually help your sleep, right? Mechanistically, you know, for me, it's always makes sense in my brain when I have a explanation for why something may actually be the case. So for this instance here, why does exercise potentially help your sleep? Well, first things first is maybe it increases the production of melatonin. That's one thing I was looking at when I was reading the literature is it may, may increase your melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that helps regulate your sleep wake cycles, right? So when you have melatonin, your body naturally releases it in the evening to kind of get the signal, say, Hey, all right, it's time to start getting ready to go down. And so your body can, it does naturally produce it, but exercise may help regulate that and increase the production of melatonin. So that's one idea behind that. The other is also may aid in potential stress reduction. So if we have decreased stress, that may help us fall asleep faster and sleep better. May also improve your mood, which may help with um, just kind of overall falling asleep and not being anxious or anything like that. And then also it may help regulate your body temperature. And so when they mean regulating your body temperature, normally we, before you go to sleep, your body kind of cools down. And so when you train and do exercise, you are training your body how to you know, regulate better and more efficiently. And so that's the idea that if you can improve that thermal regulation, meaning, hey, I can control my body a little bit better and my temperature can, you know, go down faster. That may help you as you go to sleep because as you go to sleep, you want to have that drop in temperature. That seems to be a trigger for that. So just kind of the couple mechanisms for how sleep actually may work there. And it's kind of interesting. No one knows for sure, but that's what we're looking at. And when we talk about sleep, how do we measure sleep? Like, okay, I had eight hours, I was in bed for 10 hours, who knows what? So there's a couple definitions, specifically sleep quality I wanna talk about though. So sleep quality, unfortunately there's no clear definitive definition though. The National Sleep Foundation did leave some, some key determinants in terms of you know, what it actually means to have quality sleep. So their big determinants are that we essentially have, um, they talk about sleep latency or how fast you get to sleep, meaning, hey, when I go to bed, how long does it take me to fall asleep? They also talk about the number of wake things that you have, meaning how many times you wake up. They, they say greater than five minutes, essentially, is what they're saying. Hey, if you're less than five minutes, you probably don't remember. It's not necessarily a disruption, but more than five minutes, you know, are you waking up when you wake after sleep onset, meaning how many hours are you getting actually of sleep? And then sleep efficiency as well, meaning, hey, when you're sleeping, how efficient is it into getting into sleep? And so they're, they kind of divide up even more. They say when you're in bed, they want you to be sleeping more than 85% of your total time in bed. So there's kind of a difference between you know sleep opportunity and actual sleep, right? When you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night and wake up at six, you didn't sleep that entire time but you're giving yourself that opportunity. So they're saying in that total time in bed, they want 85% of that to be sleep. They think ideally you should be falling asleep within 30 minutes or less, waking up no um, no more than once per night and being awake for 20 minutes or less after initially falling asleep. So if you do wake up, it's not super, super long meaning you're up for hours and hopefully no more than once per night. I think all of us probably have struggled with this at some point and even if you, if you haven't, fantastic, that's great. You're probably not listening to this for then necessarily, but I think you can have either components of this, you know, I know I've struggled with waking up for me multiple times a night, just how my body works sometimes. And so trying to figure out for me, this is like, Hey, what can I do? Can I, can I improve this? So overall, how is the data though for sleep, sleep and exercise? And it's not great. 
it's kind of a bummer. A lot of these lifestyle medicine things are challenging to study because one, there's no like direct intervention, right? You can't do a placebo controlled trial. Like, okay, I'm gonna give you sleep. I'm not gonna give you sleep. It's not gonna work out. They're gonna know the difference and it's very unethical. <laughs> you know, sleep's very important. And so it's kind of challenging. It's not that robust. Um, you know, when I looked at it, the most recent systematic review that was, you know, from this year, uh, total like, amount of 23 papers. That means there's obviously more than 23 papers published on sleep. That's not work. But like looking at sleep and necessarily the overall exercise and sleep, they kind of filter things down and found 23 papers that worth in that systematic review. So not a total, not a huge amount. It's not nothing by any means. We have lots of sleep studies, but looking at sleep specifically with exercise, it kind of narrows it down. And so there are going to be lots of questions that still remain, right? So after this, this isn't like the definitive guide of like, hey, when you listen to this podcast or after listening to the literature, looked at it, like I know definitively this is what we need to do. That's not the case, but it is helpful to understand where we're coming from. You know, if you have a robust data set, you can be like, man, I feel pretty darn confident on this data. And here, this is one where it's not robust, but there's, you know, we have what we have and we're going to use it and we'll make the most of it. So first I want to talk about intensity and exercise, right? So when you mean intensity, what do we mean? A lot of times in the literature, they talk about these things called METs or metabolic equivalents. This is kind of this weird arbitrary way of like measuring how intense something is. And we kind of group it specifically for exercise into, you know, light, moderate, vigorous, but we're going to talk about moderate and, and vigorous because that's really what literature talks about. Moderate is anywhere from three to six METs. And then vigorous is going to be six plus mets. And just to kind of like reference you here, give you a frame of reference, one met is like just living your life. So like one met is the amount of energy it takes for you to just exist. Essentially, <laughs> what it comes to sleeping is 0.9, and just being awake, like watching TV, barely above sleeping, is one met. So that's just living life. Walking three and a half miles an hour is like three and a half mets ish. Jogging is about seven mets. So that's when we start to see the difference. You know, if you're walking at a decent pace. You might be flirting with that moderate vigorous, probably more moderate, but that's kind of the differentiator there. There's tons of things you can Google Met list and you'll see it's unbelievable the amount of activities that they've somehow calculated for what Mets are. You can see climbing stairs, gardening, raking, doing what well, literally doing anything. And they probably have something for that. But just giving us an overall framework, moderate is going to be three to six and vigorous is going to be six plus. So when I think about that six plus is okay, if you're jogging, that's a little more than just your standard exertion. And so when we talk about intensity and exercise, I want to talk about how does intensity affect our exercise? I'm sorry, how does intensity affect our sleep, right? When we're exercising, you know, what, what does it do? What does it matter? You know, from a moderate perspective, overall, the data seems to be very positive. And there's a wide range of many beneficial activities they've looked at. Look at people with walking, doing Tai Chi, home exercises, bicycling, playing baseball, you name it, they've looked at it. And it seems to have a pretty big impact on most things. And from a negative standpoint, there really wasn't a lot of negatives when I looked at it in terms of moderate exercise. There didn't really seem to be any significant adverse effects on sleep. Maybe at the worst in the data that I saw, it was, it was that it had no impact. But overall, I didn't really see any reports of, well, moderate exercise was bad for you from either a health perspective or a sleep perspective. So overall, sweet spot, moderate seems to be pretty darn good. When we compare that to vigorous, vigorous is also good, it seems like, but it's less clear. It seemed to show some benefit, but not as strong as moderate activity. So once again, talking about vigorous, six plus Mets doing hard things, running high intensity interval, things like that will be vigorous. It seems that morning intense workouts were helpful for some people with insomnia, but there are other showed that they didn't show an improvement with vigorous activity at all. And then one study you know, that a couple that I saw actually showed that evening intense workouts were not helpful at all for sleep quality and actually detrimental to it. And so it is kind of hit or miss in terms of the data for vigorous and it's just what it is. But overall, I think it's important to understand that you can still see benefits. Some of the studies showed benefit. Some of them showed a detriment potentially. I think we'll talk more about why that might be, but it's not as clear cut for, you know, moderate activity. If you're saying, Hey, I need the intensity right now. Moderate would probably be the way to go. Vigorous has lots of other additional health benefits. So I'm not saying don't do vigorous activity. I think you should, but once again, it's kind of that nuance and kind of thinking about what's the priority. And so next I want to talk about duration of exercise and sleep, you know, what, how much do we actually need? How long do we go, do we look at? And it's kind of muddy again, once again, we just need a little bit to benefit at the end of the day, but, um, there may be a ceiling to it in terms of when we exercise, is there too much? One study I looked at showed that 90 minutes of high intensity exercise, 
um, seemed to show worse sleep. So this wasn't necessarily late evening, 90 minutes, which I know might be a challenge, but just 90 minutes of high intensity may have, may have just had a decreased amount of sleep quality for people. Another study I looked at showed that even like light activity for 10 minutes in the morning improved sleep, although it was a very small amount, even just 10 minutes of very light activity. So that's going to be light walking. That's going to be doing nothing. And other data that I saw saw improvements in sleep with light afternoon exercise, but worse um, if the intense workouts were done in the afternoon. So that's more for intensity once again, but duration wise, there wasn't a whole lot. And so the idea is, could there be some sort of U-shaped curve? Meaning, hey, when you do some, you get benefit right away. Eventually you kind of plateau out. And then if you do too much, you actually might decrease your sleep. Is that possible? It's possible. I think we just don't have enough data to say definitively on that. But if you're doing very, very, very long workouts that may affect your sleep, I think what it comes down to is your recoverability, right? You're exercising and if you're not used to that, if you're not accustomed to that, your body's not ready for it and you feel a huge stress, then yeah, we know stress is not good for sleep and exercise is nothing but a stress and we just try to make it a controlled stress. And so when I think of duration, I think of more like were you ready for it? Were you built up to the demands of your exercise? Have you been progressively loaded to that? You know, rehab, strength and conditioning, it's all the same in terms of progressive loading. Are you building up the tolerance to that specific thing? And that's what I think about with this duration here. But that being said, a ton of exercise may not be ideal for sleep, but your mileage is going to vary. Another avenue I want to look at was frequency of exercise and sleep. You know, how frequent do you mean doing, you know, more days is probably better than others. You know, if you do more, it's probably better uh, with some certain restrictions that we look at there. When I mean restrictions, I did look at one study that showed that students and they get students, about well, 52% of them didn't exercise. So that's really sad and depressing that half of the students didn't exercise. And then 75% of those people who didn't exercise had poor sleep quality. So meaning that, okay, if they didn't work out at all, had a lot of issues with that. Other studies looked at three days a week working out all the way up to seven days per week, all showed improvement, potentially not for insomnia. Um, there were some sleep disorder studies that showed out, you know, multiple studies showing that physical activity was good for insomnia, sleep impairments. However, one study I did see showed that excessively frequent, meaning six or more times per week, um, or intense workouts may be worse for insomnia. So overall though, it does seem to be very beneficial to exercise more than less with certain caveats, meaning, hey, if you have insomnia or hey, even if you don't have insomnia and you just know that, man, when I work out too much, I don't seem to do as well, it's gonna be hit or miss. And you're gonna find that constantly here. The theme of this podcast specifically is this is gonna be a lot of trial and error, experimentation for what works best for you. And what about sleep for or exercise for sleep disorders specifically? Sleep disorders, we think about things like insomnia, and that's predominantly what the literature looked at, but there are lots of studies looking at that, and overall seems to be helpful. Um, as I mentioned before, may need to be experimental with that. There's multiple studies showing that physical activity showed various improvements in insomnia, but like I said, I did mention that one study that more than six times a week may be not as beneficial for it, but the data here seem to show that, man, for insomnia, Sometimes moderate worked, sometimes vigorous worked, sometimes vigorous didn't work, sometimes early. You know, it was one of those things where you're really going to have to find the best dose and frequency for you. And that's kind of like everything in life is I want you to, you know, really take something for what it's worth and you got to make it your own. And so when I think about the overall summary that I saw for the literature here is exercise is beneficial for sleep. Like I can confidently say that it doesn't seem to be detrimental on the whole. Obviously, there's certain situations, but it seems to be good. It's beneficial for sleep, but if I had to pick saying, hey, moderate seems to be better than intense. And by better, I just mean we seem to have less negative outcomes with moderate exercise. Also, it seems like the time of day does play a factor where morning workouts or afternoon is probably better than evening when it comes to sleep. And your level of fitness probably plays a factor. And I think once again, that goes into your level of you know, fitness meaning are you ready for this specific dose? Are you ready for this intensity? All that stuff. And so overall sleep is good for you. And I kind of walk, you know, talk about my takeaways in this. And what do I think about this? And how do you make sense of this? And the data here is not that robust, right? But the average person, you know, with sleep issues, I kind of make a checklist for like, okay, this is how you prioritize exercise for someone who has sleep issues. So if you are a person with maybe some sleep issues, let's talk about, you know, are you exercising? Number one, and we showed in those studies with the college kids, like if you're not exercising, there's a really good chance that just doing something will probably be beneficial. Even some studies showed that 10 minutes of light activity in the morning. So that's literally just like getting up and like going for a walk for 10 minutes. That would be potentially beneficial. And then if you are exercising, how long are you exercising for? Are you doing super long workouts? If you're only doing a little, we can probably get you up. You know, if you're doing 10 minutes a day, that's a good place to start. 
doing more will probably be helpful. I'm not really too worried about people exercising too much in terms of affecting their sleep until we're getting to, you know, like the one study I showed that was 90 some minutes of intense exercise. If you're, if you're exercising for 90 minutes a day, first of all, that's awesome. Congrats. You're crushing it. Then we can start to consider, you know, is your sleep being affected by that? But I, I don't even want to put that in people's brain. They're like, oh, I don't work out too much because it might affect my sleep. That's not going to be the case for the vast, vast, vast majority of people. So more is probably going to be better. One thing to consider specifically though is, how intense are you working out, right? Is it moderate or vigorous? If you are really struggling with sleep, then maybe, and you're doing vigorous activity every day, maybe just scale back on moderate for a little bit and just see how it goes, right? Maybe you scale back and you say, oh, actually you sleep a lot better. And then we can start to increase vigorous activity a couple of days a week or something like that and kind of slowly go. And so this is going to be one of those ones where nobody's going to be able to tell you, are you sleeping better? There are some metrics in terms of smart watches and devices you can use to see potentially if, if things are working. But on the whole, you're going to have to experiment and see. But if you're really trying to optimize your sleep, vigorous might be, you know, better or vigorous might be worse and moderate might be better. And then also think about when do you exercise? So if you're exercising in the evening, that might be really low hanging fruit saying, hey, we can go and shift that to the morning afternoon, might get benefit. And now if you are an average person who doesn't have any issues at all, no, no problems with sleeping, then just exercise. I think there's you do you. I don't really care what you exercise and you know, what you want to do when you do it. If everything's going well, then you don't have to do it. Really adjust based off of how you feel. Vary the time, intensity, and duration as needed. Um, and really, I don't want to make a mountain of a molehill that, hey, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But what if you do have insomnia or have trouble sleeping? Then overall physical activity, very good for you. I want you to do that. You're just going to have to experiment. I would recommend if you're like, oh, where do I start, Jordan? Well, then I'd probably say moderate activity meaning not vigorous, probably keeping it less than maybe five or days less per week and not doing it at night. Those seem to be like the general recommendations for what the data seems to show and kind of all tying into my take. There are lots of variables, right? It's going to affect people differently. Um, every person is unique in that not one person is going to respond to exercise the same way as everyone else. And um, you're just going to need experiment. I've talked about that, but you know, I also want to talk about just low hanging fruit. If you know, you do a CrossFit class at 8 PM, maybe that's not the best thing for your sleep, but we have to consider that if that's the only time in the day that you can work out and you otherwise don't seem to have problems sleeping, then I don't want you to freak out and be like, Oh my gosh, what's going on? I just always want to caution people to not over optimize things. Right? So you're saying, okay, well, if I'm exercising at night, then that's gonna be bad for my sleep. So I need to stop that and change it and rearrange. Be like, okay, let's just take a step back, push pause, Time out one second. If you're doing these late night workouts that are intense and you're still able to fall asleep fine, and then you wake up in the morning feel well, well rested, then there's no problem. That we don't have don't create a problem that doesn't exist, right? I think we do that all the time in social media with these you know biohackers and optimization people where they you know create this problem that that's not even there. And so I don't want you to create a problem for yourself. If you're sleeping well, great, keep doing that, and don't let like optimization take over, right? If you don't have sleep problems, cool, do what you want to do. If you do, then then I think it's very appropriate to tweak things. Let's say you do have sleep problems and you're exercising very hard at night. Okay, can we move that to the morning? We don't have to change anything else other than just doing it in the morning. Don't change how you work out, you know, all that stuff, just do it in the morning. You can try that. And if that doesn't work, then maybe you have to figure out intensity or time or how long, all those different variables. But it's totally fine to just tweak small things. And I don't have a problem with experimenting. I want to just put that out there. I know people are like, oh, Jordan, like, what are you doing? You don't care about, you know, I, I experiment on things all the time with myself and, you know, it's just one of those, you know, if you can't do it, teach it ideas. And I don't optimize things all the time, but I, I'm guilty of that as well. I, so I recognize that and understand anybody who's, you know, want to optimize things. I respect that and that's good, but we want to make sure we hit the lowest hanging fruit. So don't make one area of your life worse to try to perfect something. And that's what I mean. If you're saying you have these workouts that you like to do and overall you're feeling good, but now you're worried because you shouldn't work out at night. Like I wouldn't change something that we know is good, like exercise for something that may improve your sleep just a little tiny, tiny bit. Obviously, if you're sleeping two hours a night, yeah, let's change something up. But I just don't ever want to have this, you know, hyper optimization that people talk about all the time unless we need to. So when we need to, absolutely. Then we got tools. We got the disposals of, you know, how much we're exercising, when we're exercising, and how intense we're exercising, all those things. We can pull those levers and I want to do that. But once again, just take a step back and evaluate, hey, how am I sleeping and how are my metrics, right? We talked about, am I 
sleeping? Am I falling asleep within 30 minutes? Am I staying asleep? Am I waking up feeling rested? All those things that seem to impact the quality of sleep. If your quality of sleep is good, then keep on going. That's good. And overall, of this is the end of the podcast. You know, thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this, please sign up for my mailing list. I'll notify you whenever I put out a new piece of content. I promise I will not spam you ever. I hate spam. And this does conclude the episode though. So now get off your phone, get outside, have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time.